Hello on the Rockers. On this week's episode, it's a British invasion with the writer lyricist of Everybody's Talking About Jamie, Tom McRae, and actor from across the pond. Rumor is he's sleeping with the writer. Danny Pye is here. And me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. <laughs> And most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Ooh, this is not applause. I love the applause. Who knows what's going to happen tonight, but it's got to be a little bit fancy because, you know, we got English folk here. Buttons and bows and pantyhose on the rocks podcast, the place where we're too glam to give a damn. Okay, just a little movie news. Barbie just got a little queerer. Uh, SNL's Kate McKinnon has joined the cast of the Barbie movie that's also starring Margot Robbie as Barbie and Ryan Gosling as Ken. Um, It also stars America Ferreira and Simu Liu. This is the most random cast I've ever heard. Anyway, the film reportedly deals with the fact that Barbie is kicked out of Barbie land for not being perfect enough. Um, I just want to see if Ryan Gosling's can is anatomically correct. <laughs> you can check out my weekly sassy movie news, uh, my news bites, on Channel Q in 32 states playing uh, daily, four times a day to be exact. So check your local FM listings to hear more of my fabulous Hollywood tidbits. Like us on Twitter and Instagram at Alexander, or on the rocks on air, sorry. And on Facebook, on the rocks radio show. Send me an email, book me for a wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I will show up and host. Info at on the rocks radio show.com. The show is presented by Straw Hut Media. You can watch and or listen to our now almost 300 episodes for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. You can watch us on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV on the Outlet.tv app, Facebook Watch, streaming with pride on SVTV, and we are on Channel 31 on the East Coast. Hello, East Coast. The show is, of course, brought to you by Fandaddies.com, bringing you the sassiest and classiest clacking fans and hats for pride, EDM parties, sassy selfies, and even sci-fi nerds. Head to Fandaddies.com. And of course, just a word of warning, tonight's shenanigans are being fueled by the vodka tastings of Neft Vodka. Pure taste, it's damn good vodka. It's even in the name. Vodka, as it should be, uh, can be drank neat or with anything. And I have mixed it with everything from Diet Mountain Dew um, to nothing. And I never have a hangover. Woohoo! Thank you, Neft. Um, And it comes in these little cute barrels. Okay. Let's get the show on the road. Uh, please let me welcome my guest co-host for today, uh, Danny Pife, a formerly trained actor. He hails from the U- UK, has been seen in PBS's Unforgotten, BBC's A Very English Scandal, appearing in the film and stage versions of Everybody's Talking About Jamie, also on stage in The Seagull, Marquis de Sa, Pride and Prejudice, and Fancy Pants here, Royal Shakespeare Company's As You Like It, just to name a very few. Oh, my Lord, where did I find that picture from? Mm. Please welcome <laughs> Mr. Danny Pye. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. All right, we're just going to jump right into it. So an English actor now in L.A., semi-permanently, indefinitely. Yes. What's it like to kind of have to start over in a certain way um, in a different country? Well, to be honest, Alex, um, I don't really see how that's any of your business. <laughs> <laughs> He's so polite and so kind. No, it, it, to, it's hard. It was hard. I mean, I got rejected from Whole Foods to stack shelves because they told me, and I quote, I didn't have the right skill set. Well, probably you were too cute. People would be like, oh, my God, we can't, you know, we, we can't you know, pay attention to our grocery shopping. But I love that you're actually sharing, like, the reality of what happens. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's, hard. it's, it's, you have, it's, it's reinvention from scratch. So what keeps you motivated to be like, you know what, stay in this business, keep going to the auditions, keep at it, keep at it? I, I, did, I mean, it's, 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 it's super, like, cheesy to say, well, I was born to do this. But, you know, I'm in America, and you guys like that, so I was born <laughs> to do this. And I, 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 just, I just, yeah, just self-belief. Now, what, what first got you inspired to enter the acting? Like, what was your acting bug bite? Was it, like, doing school plays? W- what was it? Well, my mother desperately tried to find me a hobby. I was a bit of a tearaway child. What does tear away child mean? Well, I was just a bit of a cunt. Like <laughs> some things never change. <laughs> yeah, I'm still a cunt now. Just have just fancier. Found a purpose. Uh, <laughs> Can I borrow that line? Yeah. Okay. 
done. I specifically like drinking vodka out of a out of a barrel. Like, <laughs> girl, I've seen you over a barrel. Let me oh. just tell you. Mm-hmm. God, was that was that last week? Uh, the, yeah. yeah. So finding a hobby, did she put you like in like she, an acting everything. camp or sports, something? Sports, sports, uh, which you can imagine I didn't take to. Uh, I'm in a spaghetti tracksuit. Um, you know, just other other things like singing. Um, and I'd always find excuses of why I didn't like it, why why there was some reason that I didn't want to mm. go. And then she enrolled me in a youth theater and I had to sort of audition to get in. And I auditioned and got in. And I was like, ooh. And then I sort of, yeah, I was bitten by the acting bug and it's not let me go. And so you could put all that energy somewhere. Yes, yes. Mm. I, I Can imagine. I borrow that from you sometimes? <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> now, what kind of auditions have you been going on here um, in, in LA? What kind of roles do you want to be playing? Um, have you ever been asked to like do an American accent? Uh, yeah, I've I've done. Um, I had a, I've done a couple of. I did a show where I had to do an American accent in, in the UK actually. Um, but here, no, I've not had to do one with an American accent yet. They were the the, the, the two auditions I've been sent out <laughs> on so far. I've only been here like eight weeks, by the way, just to give you some context. It's not like I've just been sitting on my fanny but like uh well, i have to be fair um <laughs> no i've seen i've uh, seen you work at it <laughs> waiting for the phone to ring um they were both for british which i was quite lucky with but like you know i could do an american accent you'd i'd do anything can i hear your um, american accent show me the money <laughs> 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 i'm showing you the nap vodka bitch <laughs> all right okay just sh- let me have a s- I just gotta lubricate the vocal cords <clears throat> Mm-mm. it's for the throat what, do you what, do you have a sentence that you want me no, to read? Like, right? I mean, this is gonna really put me. Oh God, I don't know, man. I'm just like, I'm just like, it's not like I, I can't. I'm not like a performing monkey. I can't just like turn it on, you know. That's pretty damn I'm good. Like, you know, that does sound like a conversation I have heard in West Hollywood. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank mm. you. I did train. That was very, 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 very good. Thank um, you. And again, there must be that frustration. It's like, okay, I'm in L.A., we're still in COVID, things are difficult, and then it's like you have to knock on the doors again when you have this whole established resume going yeah. back home. And then, you know. Every, sh- and everything's taped here as well. Yeah. And I'm really not good on a self-tape. I'm better in the room. You turn up in the room, you do it. If you fuck up, you fuck up. That's it. They might direct you and get you to do it again. Mostly it's just like, thank you, and then you leave. Um, and then you often pull on a push door or something yeah. stupid when you're trying to get out. Um, and then they think they're even more retarded. <laughs> uh, sending me these crap actors and then they can't open a door. Um, so here everything's on a tape and the tendency is you want to do it 75 times. Yeah, and because you're looking at every little and thing. And there's, there's no way to, to stop it. So I, I don't like that. And it's I would much rather, yes, with COVID, I would rather be back in a room. And I like they meet you as well and they get you. It's that it's, chemistry. Yeah. And as a performer, we we get turned on when, when there's that energy in the room and there's that kind of immediate, um, you know, need to, to perform. And that brings a whole different element. For sure. And I'm, I'm needy. I'm an actor. I need validation. Yes. And I can't get that from a self-tape yeah. and a ring light. You know, and again, when you're paying every little attention, the first recording I ever did, because you know, I sing musical theater. I've done musical theater at a church. I've done musical theater at a cemetery. I've done it like at a huge stage. But the first time you go into like a recording room and you hear every little scratch, every little, oh, you know, and yeah. then you're like, oh, can I take it back? And there's like yeah. a whole orchestra. So I'm like, no, you can't take it back. Yeah. Like, do it. Yeah. But you become your own worst enemy. Hmm. Which <laughs> is, which is, you know, what I've been doing for, you know. The majority of my life. Now, when you look back at your scope of work and, you know, having worked with like the Royal Shakespeare Company, which, you know, very impressive, especially here in the States. Like even we know what that is. Um, what has been one of the best experiences or the biggest challenges that you've grown most as an actor from from one of your past shows? I'd say that just live theater in general. Yeah. Every audience is different. They'll laugh in places where they didn't laugh the night before. They won't laugh at places where they did. Um Sometimes you'll have to stop because they're so enthralled by the performance. They're laughing, they're cheering, they're throwing things. Um, and, and sometimes you have to just wait for them to calm down. But every performance is different. And and it's live. You can't go again. Yeah. You fuck up, you fuck up. The tendency with television, as nice as it is because the paycheck's bigger, um, you can you can just go and go and go and go. And... and you could do a really good take where you were you were great, but 
your co-star wasn't great or something fucked up with the sound or like someone wasn't stood on a mark and uh, and then or the editor's like, terrible and then they have to go again and then you do it again and then you in the edit you watch it and then you're like oh that wasn't i don't right. think that was the best take but they ha there's there's numerous factors they had to edit around to make it to composite that scene that you see on the telly television sorry um <laughs> and for, yeah just for me like you just learn so much every night when it's live and it's there and it's a shame that i i mean i, th I think la is getting better for theater like for sure um <laughs> with cricket <laughs> slay play and no uh, very everybody's good he's talking about jamie well i mean you had everybody's uh, talking about jamie in in, a, in, in the theater uh, center theater group uh, but I'll tell you, L.A. in general for theater, you know, in other places, there could be a small hole in the wall theater that does amazing work. Not so in L.A. It's either the big productions that come in that are great, but the theater scene in L.A. on the whole is not it's not quite what it should be. Part of that is there's not the support for it, which is surprising because we're in one of the biggest entertainment cities. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not it's not quite it's not quite there. Well. <laughs> maybe we can change maybe, that. Maybe I'm hoping to put on a play. Oh, well, you know, I can help. I know a few people. Thank you. What play would you do? So it's a modernized Japanese no play, and it's called The Lady Aoi, and it's set in a hospital. It's, o it's only 50 minutes, so don't be perturbed. Uh, there's no intermission. Um, you just have to buy the wine on the way in. And, Done. Um, it's um, about a man, A very. he's described in the script as a very attractive man, and he's had an affair with a much older woman. Like, it's much older, so I sh she 60s. And it's set in a hospital where his wife, his young wife, lies dying, and it's just the two of them for the whole for the whole play. And yeah, it's very creepy, very. I'm intrigued. Macabre. And if, yeah. if you want me to read for it, it's it, it's fine. Totally. I, I kind of saw that in your eye. I'm like, mm, totally. you'd probably be pretty good for it. I'll be yeah. like, <laughs> unplugger. Let's do a two hundred. <laughs> Now, here in, in, in Hollywood, there's this big boom and this big stress right now on inclusion, representation, and so minority actors are, are just what's being called for. And so there must be interesting coming from England. Um, and I want to know like what, what the kind of energy in the UK is towards that kind of casting. And now, as a tall, skinny white man, you're, you're in the mi minority right now in what's being cast. Is that a weird feeling? Did you just say I was skinny? Well, you, Thank you. Honey, you can fit into Zara. Oh, yeah, One of the second cute. things he ever told me after meeting him in his entire life to me was, I got a Zara. You have to be like you a can size sometimes negative have some zero. some great stuff in Zara. Like, sometimes it's like shit, but then it's like... I can't even wear a scarf from Zara. They're like... Ugh, <laughs> uh. It's like it's just meant from one shoulder. Mm. Sorry, what was the question? I got. I saw myself on the monitor and was like, oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> did My you ask God. Me? Oh, I feel so sorry for Tom. Um, <laughs> no, but with this big focus on on racial uh, diversity and casting, now coming here to L.A. as oh. as a white man, frankly, you're in the minority now. Do you mean because I'm an immigrant? No, because you're very uh, white. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hopefully that transcends because I am gay and autistic, so I'm ticking two boxes. Uh, but I would say, you know, and this is a whole other conversation, being gay in L.A., there's this term, uh, and some people hate the term, and f quite frankly, if I was a casting person, I would use the term, it's, you know, uh, passable. You wouldn't walk in a room and be like, oh, God, he's going to be the new, you know, Jack and Will and Grace reboot. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do see that you are very passable. And the work that I have seen, you know, from PBS yeah. and, and, and projects like that, you are very yeah. passable. Oh, I've not played a single nice person like I've played neo Nazis and thugs and skinheads, and I've not once played a gossipy gay man yeah. who has a great time with the girls uh, and sips on rose. And you know, I'm never, never. And is that a part you would want to play, or do you think it would limit your career? I mean, at least once. Yeah, you know, it's for fun. And I think we're past the point of being typecast like that. You know, now like actors like Neil Patrick Harris have kind of overcome yeah. that. Now he's playing all these different kinds yeah. of roles. But back then, it's a very For different sure. Hollywood. For sure. The, o the only thing that sort of irks me a bit about the acting industry, I don't know whether it is the same in America, and uh, this might uh, put me on some kind of blacklist in the UK, if anyone listens to it. Um, there are a lot of northern working class actors out there. I'm one of them stop casting posh people to do these shoddy northern accents like it's it's not fair and just stop <laughs> this is very interesting to me and we're actually going to talk about it later in the show when we talk about casting of the movie everybody's uh talking about jamie um 
because it goes in this conversation of gay playing gay, trans having to play uh, trans, uh, differently abled actors playing differently abled characters, and, and so forth. So it sounds to me that there's a little bit of elitism happening, and the actual representation is not happening. I'm totally, like, I understand why the guy in Atypical had to not be an autistic actor, because as someone with that level of autism can't lead that show. See, and that's the logistics of actually making you can't be number budget. one on yeah. a call 100%, sheet like 100%. And, but so they brought in the the group in season two with the autistic with the autistic actors because they can just do that once there's yeah. no like mm -hmm. constant taking but to lead a show like that you can't be severely autistic as much as you know we would like to see you know the diversity and like my friend wrote a play that was on at the national and it had the first ever lead down syndrome character in it like you know and you know it is it is changing but there are there are certain things that i think that some you know minorities can't handle and the stress of being number one on a call sheet and being the lead and it, i think it's i think it is it's, it is very difficult and not every actor can play every part that is very true Kristen Stewart as Diana. <coughs> <laughs> um, but these are the conversations I think we should be having in honest conversations about how we feel without being so worried about being PC or, or whatever, especially if you're from a certain group. Like, I don't think gay n n has to play gay all the time. I, no. I just don't. Some of our LGBTQ actors are not very good actors, but because they are that letter, we're lauding them as these great actors and they're getting awards, and I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that it's, uh, it's well-earned. Yeah. I won't name names. I'll just call them later. Okay. <laughs> oh, we're getting to dicey, dicey area here. But this is what On the Rocks is about. So we're going to drink a little bit more vodka. We're going to take a look at the trailer for the film. Everybody's talking about Jamie because uh, we are our guest of honor, writer, lyricist. Um, and it's a film that took the nation and the globe by storm this summer in the slump of COVID when we all needed some positivity and we needed some joy and we needed some music and frankly, a musical that made sense. Um, it wasn't too musical and it wasn't too like, you know, uh, gritty. And, uh, it, it was very accessible to many different generations, gay, straight, older, younger. Um, and so I was thrilled when I had the opportunity to interview uh, Mr. Tom McRae for Metrosource. And um, so right away I watched the film. So let's take a look at the trailer. When we come back, we are gonna talk to Mr. Tom McRae. This is your last careers lesson. So does anyone have a realistic career plan? Tyson, Denzel, what about you? YouTubers. I keep telling you all, you gotta keep things real. Jamie. Jamie New. Me. What do you want to be? A performer. For a minute there, I had such high hopes for you. <laughs> what is wrong with our boy? You remember when we was little and we used to play dress up? Well, for me, that's a game I don't want to stop playing. I'm done with this. I wanted a son so badly. I got you. The cold, empty morning. I don't think I've got a dad anymore. You've done nothing wrong, Jamie. You never did. So, why do you want to be on the stage? I want to be a drag queen. Because it's all I ever dream of. And when I close my eyes, it's all I can see. If Jamie wants to come to prom, he comes just, just like all the other boys. You are a freak. They made me feel so ugly. I'm scared. You can't just be a boy in a dress, Jamie. A boy in a dress is something to be laughed at. A drag queen should be feared. You won't believe the power it gives you. I don't just want to be one. I have to be one. Stop waiting for permission to be you. Who you want to be. You are the bravest person I know. You're like Beyonce. No. Mom, do you ever wish I were just normal? No. Never. And you don't even know it. 
Your room's so tidy, I don't know how you do it. I don't have as many dresses as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, that's one of the best trailers I've ever seen because it does capture all of the points of the film, and it's so thrilling, and the film is equally um, as thrilling. So, uh, uh, without further ado, joining the ranks of Ryan Murphy and Greg Berlanti in elevating the LGBTQ characters and voices, writer Tom McRae made his U.S. film debut with Everybody's Talking About Jamie. The show itself started as a collaboration between Tom McRae, who also wrote uh, the, the play, screenplay, and musician Dan Gillespie Sells, responsible for the songs, and collaborating on the film score with Oscar winner Ann Dudley, who uh, was involved with the Full Monty. Uh, Tom is entirely self-taught in screenwriting, playwriting, and scripting for television. He was nominated for a BAFTA early in his career for writing the TV movie Off Limits, Schools Out. From there, he's worked consistently, notably as a writer on the cult hit TV series Doctor Who. Then he created and wrote Threesome, Comedy Central's UK's first original scripted comedy since that channel was renamed in 2009 which got him noticed in the U.S. He's also written for The Librarians and has many exciting projects in the works. Some he can talk about, some he can't. Rumor has it, is there a new musical in the works? Maybe it's about a husky Latino podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome, everybody's talking about Tom McRae. <laughs> He's always so dapper. Like, like, I have to know, like, do you wake up, like, dressed dress to the nines? Because I've never seen you slumming it. These are my pajamas. Yes, well, I, 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 I literally believe woke that. up dressed like this. I, I believe that, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, I have to sit very still or else it gets creased. <laughs> so we, have a, we have a very loveless marriage, so it's easy to do. <laughs> Uh, everybody's talking about Jamie uh, took the world by storm over the summer um, and the show just made its debut in Los Angeles for the last two months so for us here in the States it's relatively new it's a new phenomenon yeah. um, how long have you been working on the show from the very first ping of an idea how many years has it really been well in my office in LA I have the four pieces of paper that we sketched out the show on with the date at the top which was December 2013 Oh so God. it is coming up for eight, well, uh, more than eight years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, it's kind of in some ways flown by, but in other ways it, it does feel like a significant chunk of my life. But I'm still not bored of it. I still love the show. I went to see the last show on Sunday. I didn't fall asleep, which is a, which is a good review. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and we continue to kind of roll out across the world and um, hopefully be in Australia this year because COVID, did, did you hear about the COVID thing? No, did yeah. that happen? I did you have it in LA? What? It Today? was huge in London. Oh my God, we couldn't stop talking about it. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and, it, and it, it, it completely fucked my life for two years. But I think now getting on to be on the Armandson, we've just closed, sorry if you missed it. Uh, but it was absolutely joyous. And the audiences, the American audiences loved it. And it kind of felt like, yeah, we're back. We're, we're, the world is reawakening. Well, and the, the, the demand for this kind of positive entertainment. You know, we have done such a great job, our community and beyond uh, other minority communities, by putting to putting out some really great content during COVID, but a lot of it was so heavy and monumentous that it was a little daunting and it was a little like, oh God, it was it was kind of depressing. Really good content, but depressing. This was like this this bright of of uh, this bright flash of light. And it really did affect across generations, across audiences, um, and even critics you know, loved it. And critics are, you know, hard to... Um, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of... <sighs> James is the kind of character where if you told his story 20 years ago, he would have been persecuted from Act 1 to Act 3, died of AIDS probably about 10 minutes before that's, the end. That's exactly but right. he would have made a straight girl feel really good about himself because he would have learned how to be true to himself. And that would be his function. He would be someone's best friend, comic relief, and then dead. Yeah. And we wanted to take that boy who is real. I mean, like Max, who played him in the film, is kind of a, a Jamie. In fact, we, um, we, we've just had the first ever school's production of Jamie. It was on in November in the UK in Notre Dame School in Sheffield. How I'm exciting. I'm sure you're watching this now, so hello Notre Dame School in Sheffield. Mm -hmm. And they, they'd asked if, if we ever did it for schools, could they do the first one? So we, we trialed it on them. I defuckified um. the script, um, took out some of the sexual references, not as many as I thought I had when I watched a bunch of 12 year olds doing it and did feel a little bit queasy, but it was glorious. Parents, they're so proud. It was such a fun night and it was a little trial school. So it will roll out this year across oh, the world. So you can get for rights for it. For teen groups. Yeah, it's going to be in every rights. high school from here to... I, I, I hope so. Uh, it, that would be wonderful. And, and that what's so lovely with that is, is that accessibility means yeah. that people come to a story, which is quite tough and does have its hard knocks to it. Uh, but does have a happy ending, which, because it's kind of a true story, did really happen. But we had, we were having discussions about doing the school's edition when we were shooting the movie, and we had Samuel French, our publishers, come yeah. down onto set. And Max, who plays Jamie, 
when he heard what was going on, he said, th this is amazing at school. I was having to kind of butch up and play Danny Zuko in Greece, even though That's nearly so all funny. those boys who do the musical school projects, they're all the gay kids. Yep. Yeah, they're all having to play like, what's his name in Carousel who knocks his wife about? Billy, Billy Bigelow. Billy Bigelow and, and all these kind of big butch boys. And they're, they're not, they're Jamie really. And now they get to play Jamie and a bunch of, sorry, microphone, a bunch of other drag queens. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Carousel. We did Carousel in my high school. And that's when I f was first kind of feeling, well, I was sleeping with one of my best friends who was also in the musical, but I still didn't put that word gay. And then we were doing Carousel, which is very gay, especially when you're doing a, 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 a song called Blow High, Blow Low. <laughs> and it was like, this I irony is not I did, lost I did carousel at school. Yeah. I don't remember uh, that sorry. song. I well, would have been Blow 11. high, blow low, a wailing we will go. And then it's all, it's only men in this whole dance thing, and it's blowing everywhere, le left and right. <coughs> I, I tell you, we, um, uh, so Samuel French used to go into the rehearsals, because, you know, school play, they rehearse for months, because they only do, like, yes. one night a week. So we'd get these rehearsal reports, and, um, and one of them said, the 15-year-old boy who plays Hugo, the older drag queen, uh, there's a line that Hugo has uh, backstage where he says, it's been a long time since I had such a generous daddy, talking about Jamie's dad actually paying for his, his dress. And this the show report said, or the rehearsal report said, the 15-year-old boy playing the older drag queen delivers the line, it's been a long time since I had such a generous daddy, far too well. Uh -huh. And when I went to watch it, it was, he, he, the way he did it was he went, um, it's been a long time since I've had such a generous daddy. I was going to say, well, Daddy means and, that and to it me. Was, like, Come it on, was, sugar. And, but his parents were there in the audience, literally crying with pride because they said he's, he's come alive through doing the show. And it was wonderful to see the acceptance because the community where it's set is also Sheffield is where we open the show. And Jamie in Sheffield is like Mickey Mouse in Disneyland. Yep. We are the mascot of the city and we are so welcome there. And it's it's really impacted a lot of people's lives. And so we're just trying to take that like lovely local buzz and put it out across the world. So it always feels like it's your local town. So in LA, it's it's your friends, it's your community. Wherever it goes, it kind of finds a community. And you know, the younger generation, they're having these conversations. They're talking about binary, non-binary. They're talking about coming out. They're talking about trans issues so young and so it's very appropriate for a musical like this yeah. uh, to be in it, especially when we're dealing in the US, especially in Florida right now, there's a bill that's getting very good traction um, that not only will out gay kids to their parents or LGBTQ, it's 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 the whole alphabet, um, but it also, um, it also wants teachers not to be able to teach about it or discuss it at all to the point that you could sue the school if well, that, that happens. When I was growing up, it was called Section 28, which was a Thatcherist policy, which was the exact same thing. Uh, and in the Jamie movie, in the flashback scene for the new song, which is yes. the big um, kind of street rally, that was supposed to be a Section 28 protest. And it was a, it was a real paper tiger, if you use that expression here, it, as in it, it never meant anything. It, no one was ever prosecuted. It was never even clear what it even meant. But the fear was there, and so people became, yeah. teachers became self-censoring. Yeah. Out of fear, it could be them next. And I'm glad to say, that things have moved on so far that it was a conservative government, which was the, the, the right-wing party, that was Thatcher's party, that brought through gay marriage uh, in the UK in the early 2000s. That's how far it's moved on, and it's not moving back. But here in the States, where you do have each state has its own reality, yeah. And it, yeah, it, it is worrying to see it, that things can be rolled back or can be attempt to be. It's very scary. It's like we're, we're going back in time, yet Hollywood um, is, is progressing. It's a really weird um, dichotomy. Uh, now, we got this question from, from one of the Jamie fans. Is How did you, because you were writing, you did Doctor Who, you did Threesome, you were having you know your, your great career writing for TV. How did you get involved with the Jamie story? Well, Dan, uh, who I wrote the songs with and created the show with, is one of my oldest friends now. Uh, and uh, he, when I first met him, I loved his band because he's a pop star. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my sitcom was on TV and he liked the sitcom. So we became friends and we just used to kind of drunkenly say, Lara, write a musical, write a musical. And then one day he rang me up. Um, this is a bit on the rocks. Uh, but I'm say, some of the best collaborations come from uh, from drinking. Well, uh, and, but then we actually did it, and that was that was the difference. Martinis, was, it was, was, it? It was we were drinking espresso martinis, martinis. Yeah. and then we decided to go and actually do it and stop just talking about it, which is that is the trick. With that doing is anything. the key because everybody talks and it's like, oh, yeah. we should do this, and it really is. But then, we, but we did, and it all fell together so easily that I still to this day can't believe it really happened. Uh, and we we met Jonathan Buttrell, the director. Uh, and Johnny had seen the documentary which inspired it all, Jamie Campbell's real story which inspired it all, and he was looking for writers. And when he met me and Dan, just through chance, really through a, a, a mutual acquaintance, um, 
he thought, oh, these are the guys that I've been looking for. And we hadn't done anything then. We'd done a lot in our own worlds, but we hadn't right. done anything together. And we hadn't written a musical. I'd never written theatre. I'd never written a song before. Um, but, you know, we, we had this ambition to do it. And he just felt that we were the guys. And so he offered it to us within a few weeks of meeting him. And then kind of the next year we had the first workshop. And it, it just had this momentum. And we always knew it was a really good idea because it, it just kind of carried itself in a way that good ideas do. We were never having to force it. Um, and then once it got unveiled to the public, it turned out enough people agreed with us that we're still talking about it all these years later. And I have to say, it's like in every person's musical. Um, and I saw the movie first, um, and then I saw the, the play, and I, I thought, oh, the play's probably going to be very musical, whereas movies usually pare yeah. it down. Um, and it's, it's not such a musical that it's so rote. It's not a paint-by-number musical, and that really does make it accessible for people that might not care for musicals. It's much more talking than singing. I think it's probably about 70% talking to 30% singing. The film is probably 80 t talking to 20 singing. And all those cuts we did. It was our baby to do with as we would, and we took the songs out, we shortened it. We, we understood that a film audience looks at things differently from a stage audience, and a song will overstay its welcome. Uh, um, Stephen Sondheim wrote once, uh, about how uh, you, you said you, in a film where you have a close-up, you can cut an entire song and replace it with a close-up, which doesn't exist in the stage. And we did that. Um, if I Met Myself Again was cut from the film. We filmed the whole thing, choreography, night shoots, all of it. Oh, interesting. But the look on Sarah Lancashire's face as she walked down the street getting ready to sing the song sold the whole story. And we're like, What's th what? it was just three minutes of her repeating what we already know. So we were very r um, ruthless about stuff like that. But then in also just I wanted to have more dialogue. I'd feel... It's just a way to get, it just makes it feel less stagey. Um, and it makes it feel more contemporary and the kids who are teenagers feel like they're teenagers. Whereas most musicals probably are more like 30% talking to 70% singing or sung through. Right. And some of those are great, but I wouldn't know how to do that. Or it's also the musical, like very old fashioned Rodgers and Hammerstein, where there's nothing wrong with that, but it is very kind of dated where it's like, talk, talk, talk. <clears throat> and then the, the orchestra yeah. plays and it's like, now we're going into a song. Uh, and they always have the fantasy ballet in Act One. Always. That was and that was a convention. I don't know when it stopped, but it was every... And no one questioned this. Someone yeah. at some point, I reckon, in the 70s went, why, why do we do the fantasy ballet in Act One? Yeah. Actually, I don't know why. And they'd stop doing it, but they always used to just stop the show and they'd have like proper ballerinas who didn't have anything else to do apart from come out and do the fantasy ballet. Yep. And then they'd, then the show would carry on. It was almost like like the halftime, like the Super Bowl thing. Do you know when that started to change was when movies like Singing in the Rain put them in the film. And like you said... Uh, film audiences don't have that kind of patience. And so if we remember Sing in the Rain, which is one of my favorite films, goes into that whole weird montage with Sid Charisse, and it has nothing yeah. to do with the rest of the film, and that's when you're kind of like, oh. <laughs> and so that kind of started like, okay, we don't, we don't need it. Um, hmm. Just looping back to something that you said before, yeah. Tom. Yes, Danny. Um, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I have a little secret to share in a little bit. When you were saying, um, oh, we had to be ruthless and cut things, mm. how important is that, do you think, to like new writers or writers who are starting out on the ladder and who are, I know, I think people can get quite precious about their projects. Yeah, kill your how babies. How That's how you make it work. Is yeah, is it important to be? You have to be. You have to be a, a very strict editor. I I got to the point where I was too strict, and I'd have like Johnny would say, well, "You've cut that scene that I like." I was like, "Ah, oh, cut it, cut it, cut it." But uh, yeah, you've you've got to. It, it, it's just a blueprint. It, the finished thing is what counts, and the finished thing will only be good if the the blueprint is is right, and it's not supposed to exist for its own sake. And I think there's certain new writers out there that are like, I want to be a writer, I'm, I want to be a Quentin Tarantino, I want to do this. And they have such an ego that they're not paying attention yep. to the actual mm -hmm. story that they're writing as that it's a cohesive uh, yeah. uh, I, My, my best advice would be particularly for theatre writers, and I've only written one theatre thing, but it did do well. So I, I, it did I okay. I, 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 I <laughs> take some <laughs> uh, amount of... But the, is, don't write speeches. And I'm going to look right down the lens and say, you're writing a speech, stop it. Until you really know what you're doing, leave speeches alone. Speeches kill drama people don't talk okay i'm giving a speech now but i am a professional i'm allowed to normally people don't talk in speeches give us maybe one <laughs> i have a two speech rule don't don't interrupt my monologue i have a two speech maximum rule in any project and no more than two and and stick to that and, and you'll do something that people want to watch okay well let's talk about this because you uh in many interviews you've said that you know you don't uh you did at the beginning you put a lot of yourself a lot of your own stories into the writing and in everybody's talking about Jamie, you, you didn't really do a lot from your own life. Uh, 
save for one part, which is not a speech, but it's it's a very strong statement, and I could see an actress using it as a monologue. Can, can you show? Uh, no, it is, no, it is the one speech. Yeah. Is is Pretty's takedown of Dean? Yeah. So I I don't I I maybe one day I write something about my own life, but I I I don't, and my family relationship is nothing like Jamie's. My dad is the biggest Jamie fan in the world, really. Um, but for Pretty, where she takes down the bully. I did. I mean, I called in Dean because there was there was a couple of deans at my school who who, who were not the nicest. Uh, and Probably called Dean too. That's no, no, a very they, 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 no, they were both called Dean. <laughs> uh, and uh, I thought it would be nice for her to say what I wish I'd said. And I was never smart enough or funny enough or brave enough to to be pretty. But in that moment, yes, that that is me. And it's a rare moment of just putting myself into something which I don't normally do. Um, and I've always said to the actresses playing, you know, that that's just me that bit. Uh, and <laughs> the only other time I've really done it was in Doctor Who um, when I wrote a speech for Karen Gillan when she was playing Amy Pond about why she found her husband beautiful and how when you meet someone you maybe think they're not that beautiful but when they, you get to know them their face becomes them and they turn into this wonderful thing and other people who are gorgeous when you get to talk to them can become very plain and dull and I just kind of noticed this uh, being out and about and being single and I wrote this speech and, and I cut the scene and the producer said, you have to put that speech somewhere else. And I was like, oh, really? Because normally cut speeches, cut speeches. Yeah. And I put it somewhere else and Karen delivered it beautifully. And I know it's been done at a few weddings because I've had people contact me on oh, social media and say, can we read this at our wedding? And I say, no, but I think they do it anyway. Uh, it's like, no, I'm going to come to your wedding and I'm going <laughs> to, with, with a collection <laughs> box. Is it open bar? No. <laughs> I, I, want my, I want my 50 quid. No, uh, 50 pounds. Uh, no, of course I say yes. And it's very flattering. Although why you'd want to do your wedding speech, a speech about how, how ugly your, your I, partner I did, is. I didn't think you were hot when I met you, but now I've got to know you, you're all right. But yeah, so it's sometimes just a little bit of yourself is good. And, and for, you know, that's for me. For some writers, maybe it's all about them. And, you know, Maya Angelou, fantastic writer and she literally just told her story um but in a beautiful way so it's, it's there's no hard and fast rules but for me I, I like to keep a distance i don't have characters that are secretly me um in 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 scripts but maybe one day well it's very interesting uh yeah. like christopher guest who's one of my favorite filmmakers and writers uh he wrote waiting for goffman and of course he played corky in it you know big cult film the first version that he kind of edited together he cut himself out entirely out of the film um, and it's the same because he was like, oh, it's about them. It's like, no, it, it's an important part of the full story. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. And, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about your background, you kind of didn't have any formal training whatsoever. No, nothing. And so this kind of intuition to care more about the overall story rather than ego, ego, ego is that's a natural ability, I, I would say. Well, I, maybe it's just honed from mistakes. I don't know. I've been doing it a long time now. So ev every job is an education you know you never stop learning and i've always been surrounded by teachers uh older younger you know more experienced less experienced there's so much to learn from people so education isn't something that finishes when you leave school with a piece of paper 100%. uh and and it doesn't mean you know maybe the best way to get it is to do that or maybe it's it's to not and i just wanted to to just do it i didn't want to be taught it i wanted to discover it um and what my early instincts were i think was just try and be funny that's what i tried to do and uh, and and I so I kind of honed that, but maybe the kind of yeah the, the the sort of leaving the ego behind probably was something I maybe learnt more than was an instinct, but it, it feels instinctive now. Now you are a formally trained actor. Yes. So what is your school of? We know some like rough like 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 James Dean talking about Deans. You know, like his kind of approach to acting was just very guerrilla style. You've kind of experienced a little like both sides. You've worked with actors that have no training. Yes. Um, but being part of Royal Shakespeare Company, I mean, you can't really walk in with no training. It was, ve it's very, m I went to a school that was very method. So it was very much like you live, sleep, I got kicked out of many eat. schools that are very method. I'm <laughs> not, I'm not a fan either, to be honest. It was the, the one thing, this is the, was the big thing that I took from my training. Like the rest of it, I like, I like to fag in, sorry, a cigarette. I like to cigarette. In, in I've <laughs> seen you do both. <laughs> <laughs> I like to cigarette in the morning with my brew, which is a cup of tea. Uh, and I Why don't you guys drink coffee? It's so good. I, well, I was I coffee after lunch. I tea, was 19. Tea, tea I so didn't weird. like coffee at 19. And um, I, yeah, I'd have my fag and a brew. And um, <laughs> That's the name of a show, by the way. Uh, yeah. Fag and a brew. It's a one fag man and a show. And, um, starring Danny Pye. They'd be like, oh, no, yeah, you can't do that if you're, like, doing an acting class first thing in the morning and you're playing Macbeth. You have to come to school as Macbeth. And I'd be like, fuck you. Um, so the thing the thing was, the one thing that I took from that, yeah. the whole method training, 
the rest of it was bollocks. The one bit that I found very interesting, which I still carry with me, is did my character walk or run to get into this scene? <laughs> That's... How did they enter? Did they walk or did they run here? Yeah, That's I, it. I think you, All like, I took. I, I probably have like five or six useful things like that that I would tell you, new writers. Just things I picked up that would take half an hour to explain. And there's a bunch of good stuff you would get from a drama school. Um, but for some people, you, you could just do a kind of checklist of the of, of the, the greatest hits bits of advice. Yeah. yeah. Well, and method works for certain people. Like uh, like I said, it didn't work for me at all. I don't like no. structure. No. But also, uh, when I studied that, it also helped me to do, like when you're in a show and you do eight shows a week and you have to be regimented and you have to stick to a certain structure. But when they were doing Saving Private Ryan with Tom Hanks and, and, and Matt Damon, um, they put him through like four weeks of boot camp training and they almost uh, Matt Damon was passing out because he was so starved and all this and they were doing an uh, interview with Jack Lemmon which you know Jack Lemmon is you know a great actor and they asked him you know what do you think about this kind of method and all this he's like why don't they just act yeah and like that's yeah. what he said it is it, it's 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 a tap and I, I don't know maybe I'm full of unpopular opinions this evening but like you should just be able but to it's whatever turn, works you should just be you. able to turn it on and off like you yeah, should and, be and able to go home and be just you. But some actors can't do that, so I could see where they would have to do it. Yeah. The, I, I've heard amazing stories about a very famous British actor, who I won't name, but uh, but the Daniel the Damon. ritual he would have to go I was to. Just gonna see no, that. it wasn't. But but to my left foot is tingling. The mm. character that he'd play w kind of consumed him so much that he actually was taught this speech that he'd have to look in the mirror and he'd look, he'd, the character had an accent and he would say, "My name is." Blah blah blah, and I live at this oh, house, and my about. wife is called blah blah. And gradually, he turned back into himself. Um, and also, that his character famously wore a little moustache, which was a glued-on fake. And so, when he did ADR, which is when you go into a sound booth and record extra dialogue that's not oh, there on the day, on. he'd just stick a little bit of tape on his lips, so it felt like the glue oh, where the moustache would go on. So that's a good trick because, like, that's just a trigger. And I so say something I always do when I'm writing is I pick a piece of music that I'm going to write, maybe the scene to or, or the whole script to, or like an album. Um, often film music because it, it, you know, th without the lyrics, it, it, it's yeah. it can be distracting if there's words. And when I go back to write the scene, I will put the same piece of music on, and then it's like a Pavlovian response. I'm straight into that that mood again. So African Rundown, which is the opening track of Casino Royale, and it's about 14 minutes long. Uh, Any action scenes tomorrow. I do is always African Rundown. The James Bond film. Uh, yeah, the Daniel uh, Craig one. And then anything that's really sad is a lot of life behind us, which is a Murray Gold track from Doctor Who. That I listen to that, and that's my if someone's going to die, but in a beautiful way. That's the thing I listen to, and I have all these go-to tracks, and it's it's a really good, like with the, the the sticky lip. Yeah, it just as soon as I hear it, I go, oh, I know what I'm doing, because it's it, it triggers all those memories of all the times that I did it before. That is very interesting. So it's a good tip, actually. I, sh I should yeah, do my, my, my good, good tip tips for. But I don't know if you did this as an actor. I would I would always do a soundtrack for every show. So I'm getting ready, ready, like the half hour before when you're yeah. doing your mouth exercise, you're doing your stretches. Yeah. I would always have this like soundtrack just to put me in the mood. It was always the same stuff. But when I write an important article, like when I wrote the article uh, about you, the, I was The most important of your career. The article, most important. Say. And um, I think your name was misspelled in the first sentence. Uh. Um, but I always listen to Star Trek music. I listen to Spotify, uh. Star Trek, whatever, because it's, it's energetic and it's majestic. Um, and it's just a part of my life, and it gets your heart going in a certain in a certain way. Music sure. is so important. That's why when you know when uh, you know when we're questioning terrorists, they'll play like heavy metal music. Well, it was Barry Manilow, the um, the bridge protest in Canada, wasn't it? Which is like poor old Barry. Those, his songs are great. I, I would have stayed on the bridge just to have heard. You know, he's Jesus in, in the U.S. All the time. Yeah, I, I love it. I don't get it. I, I tell you, uh, when um, when we first started doing Jamie was when Smash was on TV. And I, I, I've been told by mm. people who worked on Broadway, it wasn't necessarily the most realistic depiction of how a musical's made. I don't know, I've not done a Broadway show, but it was a show about people doing it. And so for and me, now I was they're doing like, a Broadway version of Smash. Oh, well, everything eats itself. Yeah. And I was like, look, no, <laughs> if, if I'm going to copy I, that one down too. <laughs> and I watched it because it was like just watching people succeed at the thing I was trying to do was so inspiring. So that song, Let Me Be Your Star, became a real track that if I, when I started to feel like, oh, this isn't going to work, I'd put that on. And so when we did the press night, now bearing in mind, I never worked in theatre in my life. And yeah. we had a West End press night with all the celebs and the red carpet and all that champagne at the interval and all that shit. I saw you with Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah, it was like everyone was there. He couldn't even like put on a jacket? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a picture, by the way, and it's like, well, the, damn, girl. <laughs> the, but, uh, the, but walking to the stage door from the tube, because I went on the tube because I'm a Londoner. Yep. And oh, I did too. And I, uh, and I'd, and I'd, I knew I was going to listen to Let Me Be Your Star as I walked in, and I knew exactly 
where to start the track so that as I walk through the stage door at the back, it would just be the big final note. And I walk down the street listening to it, being like, I am in the musical of my own life now. This song that kind of kept me going through the writing process and now it took me and swept in. And it was a night of feeling like you were in a movie. Uh, it, it better than being in a movie because actually making a movie has f loads of shit involved. This was just glorious. But this is the kind of artistic stuff that, that we have and that's part of our lives. And I know you were uh, your, your parents were art teachers or art was a very big part of your yeah. chi childhood. Yeah. And we just naturally think about these kind of things, such as making a soundtrack as ridiculous as like the well, moment and everything. We could just all kind of wish that life was like a musical, right? Well, yeah. and so we see Jamie, we see the musical through Jamie's eyes, especially that beginning scene is just so beautifully and it sets the tone for everything. It's like, we all did that in school. We all daydreamed and we all were the star yeah. in our own m musical. Um, so uh, this question is actually f for me. Is it odd career-wise to still be so entrenched with the project uh, Jamie has been in West End. It's been touring. Then it was a film. Now it's in the U.S. Career-wise, do you always feel like drawn back? It's like, okay, well, yes, but I need to move on to the next thing because you know you're at the openings and then you're here for the run. You're kind of seeing rehearsals, and it, we talk now. It's like almost a decade. Yeah, it's it's it not never gets tiring. Well, it it only takes a really a bit of my time. You know, rehearsals was a week. Uh, and I've seen the show like twice. It's also the it press tour, though, and it's talking about stuff that you've talked about for now ten years. Al it, it's true. The you know the, probably most of the questions I'm going to be asked about it, I have been asked. Yeah. So you yeah. Sorry to uh, no, so, no, no, so, it's, so it's trying it's to true. find yeah. kind of interesting ways to reply to it without just making stuff up. Yeah. Um, also, if I'm doing it with Dan and Johnny because they are my best friends, we do have a good laugh doing it. It's like being you know the, the boy band, the aging boy band on tour. Well, Dan is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, we went to the Abbey. You did, yes. Uh, and so so I'm going to say about that. So we we have a good laugh, and that keeps it fresh. But we've all been doing a ton of other stuff in between. And if it hadn't been, um, again, I was telling you about this thing called COVID, which fucked my life for two years. I don't know if it affected anyone else, but it was a nightmare. Uh, then lots of new things would have happened by now already. But we're now, yeah. That we there's not a kind of like Jamie takes over my life and I don't do anything else. Period. That's never happened. Even when we were doing the original show, Dan did two albums and I wrote two TV shows just while we were putting on the original production for two weeks in Sheffield, long before it became a thing anyone had ever heard of. So we were always doing a ton of other stuff, which is kind of what keeps it fresh. We go away and every now and again we get to come back together and it's always really fun because mm. we've been doing other things and it's always like a kind of, it's like a little reunion. Yeah. And, and we love it. I had them back round to um, our house, uh, sit by the pool last week for the day and we hadn't spent just time with three of us together for ages without yeah. talking, without doing press or without something. Without business or, or something yeah. like that. Um, there could have been no way that you knew that Jamie was going to be such a hit. Even as an investor, like, you know, Hamilton's been a hit. If somebody said, hey, do you want to uh, invest 20 bucks into Hamilton? I'm like, a rapping? Some uh, no, yeah, yeah. no. Jamie, as sweet as, as it is, I would not have envisioned it was such a big hit with outside the LGBTQ. That surprised me, the extent to which. I mean, I'd always hoped that would happen. Right. Because I knew that we could assume, not unreasonably, that we would have an automatic appeal to a certain community. And what I wanted was something that spoke beyond that and not just a really lovely kind of echo chamber. Um, and my nan, who's m my mum's mum, who raised me with my mum and my dad, um, uh, was my favourite person in the world and she loved musicals and she was a dead, like, straightforward working class lady who thought Nat King Cole was absolutely brilliant and Sound of Music was the best thing ever. And Ella Fitzgerald, I, oh God, my nan really liked black music actually, thinking about it, but she, was, she loved all that stuff and I get all my love of that from her. And when I wrote Jamie, I thought I want this to be a show that my nan would want to go and watch. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a tall order because she was long dead really by this point, yeah. but um, it, it was that thing, of if, I, if I could get it for her, because my nan would have gone, boy wants to wear a dress, a bit weird. Oh, but that Jamie, oh, I love him. Oh, he's Margaret, his mum, I love him. And that would have been her way in. So I tried to make it work for her and not exclude the, the community that really it speaks to very directly. And then somehow that ended up speaking to so many people. And, and I remember watching it in London and watching the audience and seeing couples, gay and straight and old and young and grandparents being grandchildren. And initially we were so surprised, but then it became... Oh, that's just what it is. I, I don't At the Amundsen Theatre, that's what was happening. Yeah. There was every type of audience person there that was crying and holding hands and moved by, by this. That's my favourite thing about it because you don't change anyone's minds or open their minds by just talking to the same group. And we had, when we started doing the press for it, I remember... Or being so angry about your side too. A anger is a useful kind of fuel in the fire, but in itself it's off-putting. You can't... 100%. If you want to change the... Anger can power what you do, but it can't be the only thing that you then generate. 
And when we started doing press in the UK, I remember the publicist saying to me, are there any magazines or newspapers you won't talk to, like the Daily Mail, which is very right wing? I said, yeah. no, I, I want to talk to them the most. That, and actually, they really, really supported Jamie, as has the Daily Express, which is another right wing paper, which my nan used to read, so I have a residual affection for. Uh, but the, I, I was like, no, I, I want those people more. Because I know The Guardian, which is a left-wing paper, will, will be on our side. I'm much more interested in getting the Daily Mail reader to come along and go, oh, I, actually, I don't find it weird that a boy wants to wear makeup. I mean, I used to find that terribly weird growing up in a small, in a village, not even a small town. I yeah. remember seeing a drag yeah. queen for the first time when I moved to London, walking through Soho and seeing a drag queen. And I was like, that lady's very tall. <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh, my God, I didn't know where to look. I was so kind of scandalized by it. And now I'm you know, now now it's oh my god my life is so full of drag queens that I, I find it weird to see a man actually wearing trousers, uh, but it's it, it that was a process to get there. So I understand what it is to be scared of something. And for me, I was like, oh that's scary, that's cool. Whereas some people, it's like, oh that's scary, that's bad. And you just have to go em embrace the scary, but look for the cool side. Go, just don't be, investigate, be curious. And I hope that the accessibility of Jamie means that people who've loved that may go and see things a bit differently, might see more stuff, or just look at people differently in the world. Not in a preachy, patronizing way. I don't think people are stupid. Uh, it you never just wanna... was preached. And, and, also, that, I and think it's, it's really hard to do that and still have a message. And I think people might see themselves in Jamie's father's character as well, saying things that they don't realize how hurtful, not being there when they should be, <coughs> thinking it doesn't really have that kind of effect. It's that one word. He, all he says is disgusting. Yeah. And that haunts Jamie, motivates everything he does and everything bad that happens to him, which is self-inflicted, is because of that. And it's, it, yeah, the, the power of, of what a parent says. And w w we're all fallible. We all make mistakes. We all do things we shouldn't in front of people who are impressionable. But I hope that Margaret Campbell, who is the inspiration for Margaret New, is a real woman who is as wonderful as Margaret New is on stage. And she just loves Jamie, and it's very simple. She loves her son, he comes first. No matter what he'd chosen to do. If he Isn't wanted that what a parent's job is? I would have thought yeah, that was so. pretty basically what it was, yeah. But it's not always that simple, and Margaret is so clear about what matters, and she's the, the most inspirational person. All, all the wonderful moments in the show really do start and end with her. Can you share, and w we, uh, I discovered this through our Metrosource interview, when you actually got to meet her, the script was already done, yep. the show was about to go on, it was like the, the next day was like opening night it, or, or it was previews. The, it was the day before the opening night, yeah, so we'd met Jamie once, he came to Dan's studio in East London, which is a beautiful studio, and with a big grand piano and a mixing desk yep. and a sound booth and all this stuff, and a kitchen, and he walked in a bit surprised because he thought, he'd heard there was a musical happening, um, but he thought it was going to be kind of like two guys at a piano in a pub. So he walked into Dan's studio and, and first of all was like, oh, this is a bit more organized. And we played him the songs and they were all demoed up, like really nicely demoed. And I talked him through the story and when it got to His My Boy, <laughs> which is the big song written about him and his mum, bearing in mind he'd never heard it before, all, all the sentiment and emotion in it. And I was just like, just just ready yourself. And he, he just broke down in tears as we all did. Uh, and so we'd, we'd had the contact with him, um, but we didn't meet Margaret until the day before it opened. And I remember um, her talking about Jamie, and we say, you know, how, how was it, you know, uh, what the point at which she realized that he wanted to do this? And she went, well, you know, what is normal anyway? Which is a line from the show. And Johnny and I sort of looked at each other, and then she said something else, which was a direct quote of a line from the show. And Johnny and I looked at each other, and then she said a third thing, and as we left, Johnny said, you're gonna think we went home and rewrote yeah. the script tonight. <laughs> but actually, and, and then Margaret said to me after she saw it, because the, the, the scene at the school where they go in, it doesn't happen in the documentary because they didn't have permission to film in the school. So I just made it up. And she said, that's, that's literally what, almost word for word, what happened. She said, how were you in my head? In a nice way. Uh, and I was like, I don't know. I, we just have this, this thing. And then one of the most amazing things for me was having had the success in Sheffield that we went to go to the West End. We then were re-rehearsing and the Campbells came in for the first read through and sing through. And by this point, they kind of knew the show a bit. And Josie, who's the original Margaret, she sang if, I'm, if I Met Myself Again, which is all about Margaret's, the mistakes she's made with men, but how ultimately, if she hadn't made th those mistakes, she wouldn't have Jamie, so it was all worth it. And as Josie was singing, and I was sitting kind of up here, and Josie was there, and I looked over, and Margaret was in the kind of the audience bit, and she was just mouthing along to the song. And I was like, oh my God, she knows the words. 
Margaret Campbell knows the words that I wrote for Margaret New's song. And I thought, oh, she must, I can picture her sitting at home, listening to the soundtrack, these songs we wrote for her, mm -hmm. and she's learnt them, and now she's singing them. And it was this moment of going, God, it's, well, everything eats itself, right, as I said before. Yeah. And this room going, reality and, and theatre, it's all just kind of blurred together. And it continues to, I think that's part of the energy of the show. That kind of gives me the chills. And, yeah. you know, we're talking about, like, your grandma and, like, female energy. The next question I have is a very emotional part of the show is the song he's my boy yes um there wasn't a dry eye in the house uh, and again the theater crowd being mixed it wasn't just like oh you know it's an lgbtq positive show so that's the honest it was not that at all uh, it was at center theater group and we have the amundsen patrons which can be a little <coughs> old and crusty but um, I won't hear a word against them. They've been oh they, no, they've um, amazing! But I'm saying that like that's no, no. I mean, that, yeah, I, yeah, Because yeah, yeah. like, if you can get them, then you've got you've got everyone. Um, it's a mother and son story. It's not that there's nothing queer about that. It's 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 essential. It's eternal. It's it's the, the and heart a kid who's acting it. unruly, but you're still like you're still there because that's what your job as a parent. He's my boy about a mother's love. Um, and I know like your mom passed away, and your grandma was a big part of your life. Yeah, I was raised by my mom and grandma only. That's it. Um, and I started to volunteer with the West Hollywood cheerleaders, and they would go into hospice for people dying of AIDS and HIV. But it was, you would dress up in drag, <laughs> be it horrible drag. Um, and so we were at Palm Springs Pride for the first time, and I looked, because my mom was like, said to my grandma, uh, he's volunteering time, and so you know, let's go to you know, Palm Springs, where she used to live. And so I was in the Pride, and I looked, and there was my grandma, and she's like, hadn't really discuss drag or anything and it was so natural to her that I was doing something good and having such enjoyment so she's like okay well then right, you're gonna need her jewelry and her <laughs> Spanish like veils and that was the kind of relationship um, and so this really really speaks to me and, and your uh, your journey well, as well I, just I, to I throw in something quickly yeah. um, my grandma also came to watch me in Manchester Gay Pride on a float dancing. Uh, she didn't she she did and she was Can 80 she? like um, so my grandma, when I first told her I was gay, she thought it was a phase. She legit thought it was a phase. And I was dating. Because you're very right. passable. Yeah. It, it, no, it is a phase. It's a we're great just, phase, by the way. We're still, we're absolutely in the middle I'm of it. Still, I'm still traveling through. Just hasn't met the right dating, You have a certificate for your face. I was yeah. dating a guy called Jack. Hi, Jack, if you're listening. And um, I was like, oh. He's probably really pissed by now. I was like, like what's all happening? And I remember life? calling my grandma homophobic one day. Why? Because she was being quite homophobic. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> what was she doing though? Just being like really dismissive of me, and I was trying to like be true. And like my grandma was my biggest fan, and my grandma died like two years ago. And I love my grandma. And like I mean, it's, you know, it's just it's life. Um, it's life. But my grandma died three years ago. Yeah. Every day oh, yeah. I think about my fucking grandma. sucks, fucking sucks. And yeah, I remember yeah. being like, oh, I'm a homophobe. Uh, and I got out of the car, slammed the door, limp wrist. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. And um, but then to prove that she wasn't, what did she do? She knitted Jack a scarf and said, I want you to give this to your boyfriend. Isn't that such a great grandma apology? That's she amazing. knitted him a scarf. Yeah. That's <laughs> oh, Joan. No. So this is this female energy. So, so yes. the, this, the part of this question is, um, and I got this from another writer as well, um, and knowing you kind of brought kind of your grandma's decor into your own personal space at, at one point. Um can you talk about what you learned from the women in your life, number one? Number two, as a writer, how are you able to translate that where the women characters and everybody's talking about Jamie, especially from the stage show, are so powerful from the teacher to pretty to the mom to the mom's best friend. And you write these characters so well that I believe these women and it comes from such a sincere place. As a male, Gay or it doesn't even matter, but as a male writing for a woman, like how you were able to kind of do that and also talk about what you've learned from the women in your life. I'm sorry, just to piggyback on that because I had a, and that's really, a, big question, by a yeah, really yeah. great question that I was going to ask yeah. oh, in sorry. a similar tone. Um, and I don't know if I have ever said this to you before, but you are like an everyman. And it's it's so... It's so uh, I was going to say, what every man is in a, in a Willy Wonka tuxedo. It, 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 it says a lot about every man that Danny it's, knows. It's so, I mean, I, I really do admire this about you, is that you're not a 15-year-old Muslim, like, hijab-wearing teenager. You're not a single mother from Sheffield in her kitchen. 
and and going back to what Alex said is that you really you really do capture these people so perfectly, and you're none of these people, but yet you seem to be all of these people, and I'm j I am floored by just how oh, thank you, darling. How you capture the how how you capture every single character so completely. I I think it's probably a mix of. I'm an only child. Well, I said I've, I've got a very lovely half brother, but he's a lot older he's than me. Very so much I, older, I was yes. raised just me and my mum, my dad, my nan. If, so if, in fact, some of the articles say that you are an only child. I'm like, no, nah, there's yeah, somebody else. Yeah, sorry, there. sorry, Joe. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it's it. I had the experience of, of growing up like that, which means it's a lot of imagination time, a lot yes. of let's pretend in your head. So I was used to inventing these worlds, and it would be you know Luke and Leia and Han or yeah. He-Man and Skeletor, and then you'd become as you get old, you become interested in just the lady next door and the woman in the post office and the guy that cuts your hair. And, yeah. and all the things that, you know, you just pick up stuff. So I, I, I have a kind of let's pretend um, propensity. I haven't used that word for a while. Nice to, nice I love to that word, back. by the way. Uh, I put in my sorry, what does, what does that mean? A, 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 <laughs> a leaning towards. Yeah. And, and yes. I love doing, you know, Daleks and Cybermen and Doctor Who and all that stuff. But there's, there is also, you know, a, an ordinary world of fascinating extraordinariness, which is, there's a little theme for news. Uh, which is <laughs> no, that's a, another great... I'm literally full of this stuff, and so there's that. Danny told me you are full of it. Yes. Yeah, and that, and then they just true, I did. you just make it up. I mean, it, it sounds really boring to say, but it's like if you say no. to a, a professional soccer player, "How did you kick the ball into the net?" Is that the thing? And they train and they practice, but in the end of the day, they just kick it. Right in that moment, you just kick it. And there's, I guess, it's practice and it's it's that doing your ten thousand hours. But I do, I have a kind of thing in my head where I can just think okay, this is who she is or he is, and that's where <laughs> they are. I remember um, years ago watching a friend of mine, an actor uh, called Russell Tovey, talking about uh, a character We love that Russell, he of course. He was in yeah. Looking. Yeah, he, uh, over yeah. here. And, uh, and he was talking about a character play called George in Being Human. Who, uh, it, was a, it was a flat share, uh, a house share comedy about a whale for vampire and a ghost who live together. <laughs> and Russell played the <laughs> werewolf called George. And George was very sort of like geeky, but then became the werewolf. And um, and and I remember watching him. At a, it was like a BAFTA panel with him talking about his craft. And Russell, completely untrained, was kind of like I don't know what to say. And they said, "Well, how do you get?" He said a few. He said a few things in his career. So this this guy asked a very long, intelligent question about how to get into character. And it, the question was about five minutes long. And I remember Russell's answer was, "He went, well, I think George is kind of uptight. So when I do him, I just I, I can't do that." <laughs> and that was his answer. And for him, that was true. And for me, it's true. When I think of pretty or Margaret or Ray, I just I just do that, but in my head, and then I listen to what I think they'd say. And I guess because I'm not from a posh background, I've met those kids, I've got on the bus, you know, I've, I've done lots of public transport, I've heard kids talking, I've seen mums, you know, and I, uh, uh, who, who, you know, single mums just doing their thing mm. and, and paying attention. And also maybe because I'm gay, I don't want to fuck any of them, so I see them as people, and maybe that seems so. You listen a little bit more. Watch, if you watch, dramas even from like 10 years ago 20 years ago and see how women are represented when it's written by men which most things were and maybe still most things are they just sometimes forget that women are people too and that seems so obvious because hollywood has always used them as functional parts to yeah but like i don't care if she's got great tits or not so th if you take that away then you're much more interested like why am i watching why am i watching marilyn monroe in this film I don't want to fuck her. I think she's fucking fabulous, but I don't want to fuck her. Um, why am I not watching pick a random pretty actress who's not very good in another film? Because I don't want to fuck her. So yeah. if you take that away, like um, if if you're if you're kind of putting sex into it, then you can easily reduce her to that. Uh, and because I'm not, I, I think it does give you an opportunity to kind of just see what's within, and and just not being judgy or snobby. Um, and also, I've, one of the reasons why I particularly don't write about me now is that I'm a writer, I live in Hollywood, I've, I've been very well paid to, for what I've done, I don't live in the real world anymore. Um, why would I write about me? That's, That's not interesting. That's a very honest statement. And I hate movies about movies. I mean, okay, Singing in the Rain, will give that a, an exception. It was the first ever I mean, movie about a movie, yeah. wasn't it? Well, the, the stage play it's based on, well, there's one scene in the stage, it's a terrible stage play, but there's one scene Off. which is where they do the bit where the silent movie star is having to mime and the curtain comes down and you see who it really is. And that one scene became Seeing the Rain. But it was the first play to ever be about films, uh, ever. Uh, and Once in a lifetime, that's what it's called. It's awful. Um, but it's got a great staircase in the production that I saw. And I remember the staircase and that's what I remember if that's a review. But, uh, 
it, so to trying to I don't want to do too much stuff that's self reflective. I don't want to watch in the most part writers writing about writers. Uh, it, it just makes me go, really you 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 couldn't. I bet you've got a maid. Did you not take the time to look at what she's doing and wonder what her life is? You know? But this is kind of this like naturally selfless energy you have is that you care really more about the art and the project you're working on rather than yourself. I care about the audience. If I was an artist, which I'm not, I'm a, I, I used to say I was a low artist and then our West End producer said I should stop saying it, but I like saying I do low <laughs> art. I do accessible low art. If I was an artist, an artist does what they want to do and the audience finds them or they don't. It's up to them. For me, I think all the time about the audience. What does the audience want to see? And the biggest audience is th the most ordinary people, who are the most fascinating people. But you're talking about the audience, not like are th how loud are they going to clap for us? And I'm sure you've worked with plenty of actors that are the opposite. It's like they're caring about the audience, but they're caring about the audience, how much they're going to clap for them and give into their performance, yes? Yes. And I hope that's how they'll express their enjoyment, but I want them to have a good time. And particularly doing theatre, so we have a... I can only describe her as fearless. Nika Burns, our producer in the West End, absolutely fearless woman. She's fantastic. And she said, we're going to have a bunch of £20 seats every show, a, a big lot of them, because we don't want to lose Why our Jamie fans. every show do this? We want, we want the younger generation to be inspired by the arts, which they need to be inspired by the arts, because the sports programs are not doing it, yeah. right? Yeah. We know that music, uh, dance, uh, even stage managing a show helps the youth express and deal with issues so well going to the theatre is an expensive business if you want to take a family of four so it's you've so got the you, you've got the train to London you've got even hotels. Hamilton that everybody's supposed to see yeah. it's 200 quid a ticket, so a ticket. yeah 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 so I mean I, I don't I don't know how many scrappy young immigrant kids it, like myself in, in this great nation of yours uh, can, can afford to spend 200 300 dollars on a, on a, a, a theatre ticket plus the meal plus the hotel plus the train or the plane to get there and if someone's going to do that and they're going to give you their money they could have spent that on so many things yeah. but they're going to spend it on your show which is not a necessity then you have a duty to give them an incredibly good night out that's how i see it but i, I i've only done commercial theater I've, only done, I've done one show i'm talking like i'm an expert i've done one show and i might want to do my weird mad play that 50 people see and everyone raves about in 10 years time and and, I, and i'll a, embrace it for a what two it person is two-person show yeah yeah it, well he's got his yeah his his, his long dead japanese writers already I'm done that him, like no uh, no sorry it's, it's a modern day translation oh a modern day sorry but he he's been dead for quite some time now as well so the, the rights the, are free but you you you, you should <laughs> you want to think about what what someone's day was that you're the antidote to and I'm really lucky, and this is again why I don't write about me. I get to do what I love for a living. I'm well but aware. But your life is so fascinating. Most and people your opinion don't. is so fascinating. But I can take that side of it and, and put it into a guy yeah. who's a high school teacher or uh, works at CVS, or you know, th th those people are just as interesting to me. And one of my our favorite shows during lockdown was Superstore, uh, which is actually a, a, a remake of a British show called Trolley. Oh, I uh, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I interviewed um, uh, who's the Asian guy from it? Trolley or Superstore? Uh, the superstore here. The Asian guy. Uh, oh, the Sandra Mateo. Oh, no, Mateo. Mateo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We did a whole thing, and it was his story was sorry, fascinating. Ma sorry, Mateo. Yeah, sorry, no, he was we a costume designer, and he was like, that's oh, all he's going to do. And then, uh, oh God, his story is interesting. Well, like Bianca, yeah. Bianca Del Rio. Roy was a costume designer as well. Uh, which, watch that interview, because yeah, we talked was, about you. Yeah, I was watching it And we, when we just love that. Show and I've said to Danny because we're on our green cards now and and he's, he's he's between acting jobs. I was like, get a job at Walmart. It'll be just like Superstore. Yeah, they it'll didn't be, want me. It'll be so funny. You can tell me all the stories now. O over it's not it's not happened yet because yeah. he's overqualified or underqualified. The opposite to the Anna Faris podcast. But I but I find all that sort of Sorry, fascinating. Sorry, Anna Faris. Sorry, oh, we're, we're in America. Yeah, Anna. But that that's kind of my yeah. mum was the first <laughs> in my family to go to university. Um, all my. Dad's side of the family were all merchant seamen. Do you call it merchant seamen here? So yeah. like the navy, but for F money. Fishermen. No, they. It was. It was oh, like sailors. Trade. But it wasn't. It wasn't the. It wasn't like the the, the national navy. It was just the, for doing goods. I mean, we say seamen here, but it's yeah. it's not what you're talking about. <laughs> he he. Yeah, they were all big fans of seamen on my dad's <laughs> side of the family. <laughs> and my uh, mum's side of the family, who were uh, uh, well Irish bare knuckle boxers. So. Are you kidding? Yeah, what? So I didn't. Uh, have you not seen the? The picture of my granddad in the, with his great granddad with his shirt off, doing that at the family house. Yeah. No. So so I I didn't inherit any of that, but my family were just ordinary. Kind of 
And so that's what... I wouldn't call but, that but, ordinary. But all amazing, right? Yeah. But but not posh, not industry, not not big fancy or connected. Big. And so... I'm fascinated. It's, it's, it's just much more interesting. The same with your family. Like that Danny's uh, granddad was the, the Lord Mayor of Wigan. Now, Wigan is Just, just a, the mayor. Sorry, mayor of yeah. Wigan. What does that mean? Like... It's a good question. He put his, a traffic dad, light on one street and that was it. His like, dad was the MP for Wigan, which is the same as being the congressman or the Senate. No, be the same, the equivalent to Congress. He, it? Yeah, he'd be, he'd be uh, like a local congressman. And, uh, and was, you know, a, a big power in local politics where Danny grew up, but in a very working class town. So, it, it, and his family's, you know, they're just like an ordinary nice family, but they've got these kind of extraordinary facets. And that, I'm much more interested in that. Whereas, whereas and my great grandfather, by the way, just to interject with your boxing story, um, was the Ajax guy that could bend a penny in his in his fingers? Yeah, I don't know if you know him here. This is so <laughs> fascinating. No, but here's the thing: is like you've done interview after interview after interview, and it's like these are different elements that we're discovering. Um, you've you've peeled back my layers. Peeling the onion. Yeah, but this is so important, H- who especially knew? for All our it audience. Took was branded vodka. Well, no, because we have so you many. You haven't drunk nearly enough, by the way. No, he's he's like sipping. He's being like, hello. I've already I've, I've already sip. ruined my career on the. Ra- on <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, these are important conversations, and it's like the real conversations because it's where we come from. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, um, obviously we have a lot more to talk about. When we come back, and we're back. All right, so. We are going to discuss more about your past. We're going to talk about uh, Jamie the movie. Uh, we're also going to talk about Doctor Who. But uh, so I have to spill the secret. People are wondering, like, wow, why do you guys talk like you know each other? Uh, Mr. Danny Pye and Mr. Tom McRae are married. Mm. When did you get married? Four and literally we say it at ago. the same time. Oh. One, two, three. November, November the 24th. 24th. <laughs> They rehearsed that before, and they were like, let's say this. 2017. Yes. Oh, it's, it's been a while then. Oh, God, it's so long. Yeah. 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 What we did, we um, we had the press night for Jamie on November the 22nd, and we had this good idea, which was, let's get married two days after press night. all our family and friends would be in London. Everyone already here. It makes so much sense. Oh, my God, it was the, the most who proposed exhausting to who? week. I proposed to Danny. Tom proposed to me. Can, can, yeah. can you tell me? Was it just very casual? Oh, it's a great story. So we, um, we have this little special place in London called Roding Valley. Uh, which but we give them the pre-story, which so is we, we went to a friend's wedding in the Caribbean since divorced. Um, and then Tom was like, oh, this is nice. I'm going to propose to Danny. Yeah, because if someone else has something, then I want it too. And I wanted marriage. And That's very interesting. we had a lovely uh, time at this wedding. And, and I was like, Since yeah, maybe divorced. maybe it's, yeah, we, we've, we've outlasted 52%, <laughs> I'm sorry. So I used to uh, officiate so, sorry, Lucy. At, at weddings. <laughs> and every wedding I officiated at. So wow. I don't do it anymore. Oh, th- oh I thought you were going to say that was like your warm up. So 52% of you won't survive this, but have mm. a great day. No. no. Uh, and yeah, so we we had this little special place in London. It's not particularly beautiful or famous, but, but isn't that the best? Yes. And we wha- there's this little crappy bridge over this little clogged up bit of river, mm-hmm. and I and I mean it's like one that's just like a slab of concrete with a kind of one rail that's like off a like a building site kind of thing. Like no one cared. Or it's, called it. Roding Valley, it's called Roding Valley. It's British. the least visited yes. tube it's station. It's the least visited in, tube station in London. Didn't you have a picture with the yes, tube? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We've got yeah. I Heart Roding Valley T-shirts. Yeah. yeah. And so do, I, do I we have it? Oh, it's a. Uh, I mean, when I do research, I'm telling you, it's I on do my research. Instagram. It's, it's, yeah, because yeah. uh, you guys did like you went to different tubes yeah, on, on our second date. Yeah, yeah. Second, yeah. Day, second we date. We all these obscure tube stations to see what they were like. That were quite far out, but have Turns very out, interesting. That's the research lovely. we do here on, on the road. Dinner is lovely. Burnt oak is horrid. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. Uh, and and we went to Roding Valley, and we, and we just became a kind of like like our little in joke. So I I tricked him to go back there and took him to this funny little bridge. And I had a bottle of champagne stowed away that my yeah, agent whipped out this bottle of verve to propose with, and and I even brought my grand's ring and forgot I had it and forgot to get it out, so it just sat in my pocket for the right. rest of the day. And I remembered over lunch, oh, I had this thing, uh, and it still had. <laughs> oh, you have to laugh when someone dies who you love. She, she, it was this lovely interwoven gold and white gold ring, and they'd, I'd like, can I have my nan's ring? And they'd like yanked it off her dead <laughs> finger and it kind of had like flecks of skin <laughs> still in the thing and oh i was trying to clean it goodness. out but i was like but it's my nan i don't you, you i can't be precious that's about another anything. movie that you're gonna write it's you you have this there's so much ridiculous stuff about dealing with funerals and all the rest of it and but she you, probably would have left right? right oh yeah she definitely would yeah. have done mm, sure so so I, and i forgot the ring but i proposed and danny said no only because wait a wait 
a minute. Uh, I haven't found this in any interview that you've done, whatever. Why did you say no? Right, okay. Well, you have to understand, we went to, we were in Roding Valley. D Danny claims it was a kind of no way. It was no. a no way. No. Don't. Are we going to be the but first couple to get divorced on, on the rocks? On Alexander's radio show. Our it was marriage the first is time. It was on the rocks. It was no. <laughs> yes, it <laughs> He's is. He's writing right now. It yeah, was yeah. genuinely, I was just shocked. I wasn't expecting it. My the best time. My nephew had been to stay in London the night before, like on the sofa bed. Both of them had, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, it was not the kind of thing that you expect, like the day before you're proposed to, that you're like, your, nep your teenage nephews who are in a band, one plays drums, one's on keys, like, you know, is kipping on your sofa. And then, you know, they're like, oh, Tom's like, let's go to Roding Valley. And I'm like, okay. And then he I'll put whips my shirt out. on. Yeah. So then he whips out a ring and then he's like, marry me. And I was just like, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, you say, no, I haven't done enough yet. Yeah. Because I was like, I don't. Because all, all I've done is hold him back. I took that green card, I chained him down with it. Whoa, we weren't even anywhere close to the green card when this came along. I was like, financially, what am I going to contribute to the marriage? And I thought I was being quite well, sensible that comes and level-headed. Yeah, because we're assuming. Um, okay, so then it's still you beautiful did say yes. though. And I said we yes. went for lunch at our favorite restaurant, and I'd said to them, "If we turn up, it's because he said yes. If we don't, just never speak to me again about it." Oh my god! And uh, and we turned up, and they gave us oh, the, the little yeah. cake that you oh, get when you get engaged. Uh, you, you get free shit when you get engaged. It's great. You, we got a, quite a few free meals. It's a cheesecake. And, uh, and we got My best friend cake. and I used to go to restaurants. I proposed. When we uh, were a little less of funds, so we could get free. Yeah. 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 And it, and it, We've it, all it, said it it's happened. our birthday at Olive Garden when it's not. <laughs> like, What's that? I don't oh, know. No, we love Olive Garden. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is what I mean. Like, I'm that, enchanted that, with this too. Olive Garden way. is one of my favorite places. By the way, when are you going to use your unused gift card that I bought you for Christmas in 2019? Oh, yeah, it's on the fridge. We'll do yeah, it. Well, COVID, you. COVID. But so they gave us this little cheesecake and it had pink edible glitter on it. And we had our cheesecake. And the next day, Danny shat pink yes, glitter. Yes, I shat which glitter. Which I think is what um, every gay engagement should culminate with when you shit pink glitter. It was weird. Is I thought that I was a quote that I could. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was dying. Sure. Put, it, put it on the list. You can have that one. Okay, so, but let's talk about the reality of being in this kind of couple. You have been part of Jamie. How did you guys meet was through Jamie? Yes, I cast Danny in the original two workshops. And can I just bully. say as well, going back to- J Just like put all the rumors to rest. What, are you, uh, what you were saying before, when Jamie went to um, the studio to record, like to listen to the recordings, I genuinely thought Tom and Dan were two students trying to put on a musical, and I thought, oh, this is sweet. This will never see the light of day. Dan had seen Dan's band at least twice. Yeah, I'd seen the feeling like three times it. live. A lot of actors will do new projects, and I'm like, okay, let's just yeah. record, let me get my and I and, and I didn't want to go in there with a preconceived opinion of who anyone was and judge anyone differently to who to what they brought to the table. Like, I don't like to Google people before we work together. Like, oh, you know. honey, I Google everybody. I mean, yeah. unless you're Meryl. Well, clearly, Alexander like, you know, Google Even my before. Uber. And, uh... <laughs> oh, didn't Glenn Close like come to your house or she's she did yeah. yes she did once yeah, yeah. was that I mean, was, was that and, and she and she may did again you tell her to back out of Sunset Boulevard she she no Glenn's lovely no I know she's lovely but the uh, what were you saying before because I was gonna say something on that the getting that you were students oh, oh no the audition musical. the audition yes. was so I was reading for Jamie and it was me Johnny Dan and Alice Takuma, the casting director uh, now at the National, National. Yeah, but there was at the Donmar so very legit. And Danny came in, and he sat opposite me and did the bully's lines. And then you when played the bully, and I was yeah. playing Jamie for the for the audition. Possible. And Dean. then he Possible. at, well, one, no, at one point, I, I would cast he, him too. I'm going to take my hands off this. He put the script down and went up to me and did this and did the whole line like this and finished and walked out the door. And there's a kind of pause. And Alistair, the casting director, looked at me and said, "Have you got a hard on as well?" And then we cast him. But to be honest, like uh, when I first met Tom, I really did think he was, I didn't like him at all. No. I was like, who is this student? My shouting eight and a half year relationship was from somebody that we didn't get along so much that we couldn't even be scheduled on the same day to, wor <laughs> to work. Honestly. I mean, it was like, well, honestly, though, when I met Tom, I, I really didn't like him. I thought he, he did the thing, he did this classic thing in an audition 
and it was it was I was reading and I was in the moment and you and didn't know that he was new to musical theater I didn't I thought he was a yeah. student um and it was it was like when normally when you read a script you'll get to the end and then you'll do notes and it'll be like I'm sorry could you you said the line wrong here could you do the line as as it's written like you know well, that's a lot because usually now they're like thank you yeah I know but, that, but for theater they like to they like to direct because the directors well, are from actually there. Normally they want to get you out the door, but the That's fact that exactly we the right. fact that we were doing the notes bit was because you were doing well, and if you'd realised I mean, that, you it can, was you kind can, of a compliment. To you, you can dress that up however you want to. I Tom. still have the the casting notes page from <laughs> Danny's oh audition my God, that's so uh, uh, in in London, and I used to write down because we asked them to sing a song, and I'd write down just a couple of what song did well. I'll, I'll tell you. I'd write down a couple okay, of adjectives sorry. about their well, performance. Well, I sang too. I keep interrupting because I'm so excited. I'd write down a few adjectives about the performance and then the name of the song that they sang. And I found Danny's about two years after we were dating in in a pile of papers, and I'd written down "cold, scary, that's amore" because <laughs> that was the song that we did. And, and then you asked me to sing another one. Yeah. Well, we we wanted people and to I sing sang down by Jay Sean. Yeah. Which, by the way, was playing in Trader Joe's this morning. Did you hear it? Uh, it, it wasn't as good as your version. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Obviously, we've stepped into an intimate. So how did that evolve into, like, going on a date and then... <coughs> well, so after I... Because you were in the show. over wanting to punch you. You got cast. Face. Yeah, I got cast, which, to my surprise, I like. But I said to my agent, I was like, I'll tell them no. And my agent was like, no, 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 I really think you should, you should say yes to this. Why no? Because I was like, oh, the I d the writer gave me this like weird vibe, and and I don't like. Is that hundred percent true? Yeah, I was like, it's it's, it's Danny percent true. No, whoa, whoa, what is that supposed to mean? Anyway, okay. No, uh, what is that supposed to be? We're on the radio. Come on. All right, okay. So I'd said I got a weird vibe from the writer. I was like, and I was doing another play at the time where I was playing an Irish choir boy with special needs, and um. I, and that was taking up my whole laugh, life. But that's kind of okay. Yeah, I mean, I was great. It, in it. it, it was hot. Uh, and um, <laughs> I was. I love these two. I was like, I'm just busy. And then it was like this this weak thing. And then he was like, No, no, no. I really. He was like, I really think you should you should do this. Like I really. And so I was like, Oh, oh right, okay. T tell them fine. I I'll move some stuff around with rehearsals. So I did it, and you were there. And I was like, He was like, Oh, I'm Tom the writer. I'm Tom the writer. And I was like. Mm. And then we, were, as the week went on, like my iceberg was thawing ever so slightly. Um, I, I thought Danny was straight as well, because he wasn't wearing that tracksuit when I met him. <laughs> it's passable. He was he was passing yeah. big time. I think I did rock up on the first day in like a full Adidas like kind of tracksuit. Yeah, and he, he also ate a thing. cup noodle for lunch, which I've not. What's a cup noodle? A cup pot, noodle. Pot I was, was going to say pot noodle, which is I thought cup noodle was the American version it's it's like a ramen but really kind of cheap and there's nothing wrong with them they're fine but anyway i was poor and um uh, not anymore thanks babe and um what am i talking about it's the vodka uh yes um every day tom would in the green room on our lunch break come and sit closer and closer to me um and it was a classic me too romance yes this is what happens when a me too works out and um <laughs> you're giving hope to us a lot of different crowds out, out there but there was that moment that it was like love because yeah. obviously you guys are married you guys have yeah. a long lasting yeah. relationship i did a slut drop and you were watching remember yes i don't know if that is but i don't know the line there was a line in the song before it got changed oh god there was wasn't to, there um miss hedge did the what, slut drop no it was before it was do you want a slut drop I don't know if we should it's talk about It's a dance this. move. Yeah, so oh, they would, okay, like, yeah. yeah. Talk about you, it. Would, you would drop, like, you know, drop. For those watching on the, listening on the radio, I'm dropping. He's, he's dropping. They're um, going to watch the video real fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the girls got to do it, and I felt jealous that I wasn't doing it. And so there was one point where I thought no one was watching me, and the line was, going to do a slut drop in a little crop top. Um, I forgot about that. And well, luckily for you, I haven't. Um, so I was like, gonna do a slut, and I was like, slut drop, slut drop, like, and I like kind of looked at, and Tom was just watching me. Um, and then that, I think that was it, wasn't it? That lunchtime, you came and sat next to me yes. in the green room, and you were talking about bad grinder dates, and I was like, well, we've all been there, and then it just unfurled. So let me ask you, as a creative, 
you know, we see a lot of actors come in and out. What was the spark? <clears throat> and what made you like, kind of like pursue this? I don't know. I mean, it, 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 I guess I've never really tried to unpick that. I, I guess you can't. It kind of, it just happened. I mean, it sounds really kind of lazy, but it did. It just happened. All right. So let's get into it. Now we're past the romance. Uh huh. Uh huh. Danny, I want you to be honest. Dating, you know, Tom, you guys have had to go to so many like premieres, red carpets, an opening. Jamie has now like taken over a lot of Tom's life. Yes. Not for the first few years. I was just just a jobbing TV writer when we got together. The, 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 no. All the all the, the the kind of yeah. the particularly glamorous things came along quite a lot later. Yes. Has Jamie? Do you feel overtaken your life as an actor? Do you feel resentful towards Jamie? Why are you? I, I didn't use that word. <laughs> um, and and here's the point <laughs> of this question: is to how uh, a couple in entertainment can like work yeah. through this. Yeah. No, I enjoy the success of the show, and and I enjoy that it's bringing my husband success. Um, but there are there are times where I've had to like they've said you can't walk down the red carpet with him, and it, and it and it's been and it it's does been, happen. It it does and it's happen. been very much like. But we're married, and you know this is my husband, and 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 they're like no. And then you get crowded like cattle with like and down, and they push you down, and it's like well hang on I was in the film like yeah why are you push me down the car I was I was in the film I mean it's it's a hard job being a PR at a red carpet event and I've seen them do yeah. it and it's hundred percent and it yeah. must be difficult on you too because you understand what they're going for and yeah there's only so much yeah. uh, time and attention for everything but I do want Danny to be included when we did the red carpet at Sheffield for the Jam the second premiere in the UK where we went back to where it all began and did it the the, the premiere at the theatre where it literally where it all began and I'd lost him on the red carpet in London which was a huge affair and, and we me and Dan and Johnny did spend like an hour doing press on the, on the red carpet before we went in but when we went in in Sheffield where we had a bunch of our friends I said to Danny don't let them separate you from me no matter what happens make sure because I'll do the press stuff but I'm going to come back to you don't let them push you into the theatre and I was doing some press and, and out of the corner of my ear I heard Tom said, well, I'm not to be separated from him and I'm going to stand here. And I look, and Danny was holding his own. Because they're, 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 the PR were lovely. They're, just, yeah. they're trying to organize a thing and they and don't know everyone is. Job. They're, they're doing their job. They're selling their pictures. And, and if, you, if you're it. kind of polite and firm and make it clear, then you can work around it. But it's, it's learning how to do that because no one teaches you that. I mean, if you, even if you were trained, I mean, you didn't get how to do a red carpet lessons at drama school, did you? Oh, no, it's, it's, there's a whole etiquette. And it's all new to me. This has been my first time doing it. And you work out, okay, this is how you give attention to the fans at the thing. And you know, I'm, I'm so flattered that anyone would want to have my autograph, but you can get sucked into that. And then you, you really you should be doing the press because you're trying to sell a show. And it, it's all, it looks like you're at a party, but really it's a pretend party yeah. that's been put on that's for the cameras to sell tickets to It's not to as a, fun no, as, as And you have to treat as it as work. I mean and the, then you the have the an after party. pictures look great and you're wearing something fabulous. And you know, there's, there's free champagne, which helps. But it's very regimented and very orchestrated. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a professional occasion, and then you close the doors and yeah. go off and have a have so a boogie. What keys do you have on maintaining a healthy relationship while in this kind of spotlight? I I mean I'm not really in any kind of spotlight. I, they, I have little moments, and and now Jamie's finished at the Armisen, so we you know that that's that's all gone away now for a while. That also has to have a weird energy. It's like okay, you know, and now it's like okay, well I guess I'm here on my own. Oh, this is a question. We have three pages of questions. Yeah, we yeah. got through this little small section. <laughs> um, also, there's a very different way, I think, that writers are treated here in the U.S. You know, we're like, oh, they wrote this. The focus is on the actors and the directors yeah. and like this. Not in theater, which is lovely. Can you talk about this? Because I was there for opening night and you were very lauded. Um, but talk about how writers are treated differently in the U.K. than here. I don't know if there's any difference between UK and US. The difference is theatre versus TV and film. If you're a showrunner, which, fingers crossed, I'm going to be this year, then that's a different thing because then you're... But we can't talk about it, can we? I, I wish I could. I only wish I could. Um, but it, it is. It's a musical and, and it's got some great songs. And it'll be for TV, episodically. Uh, me and Dan and I'd showrun it and we've got a great director and a great team, but it's not literally selling it at the moment. Um, but if you're... 
if you're a theatre writer, then you, you you know you get your name in big letters in flashing lights outside the theatre, and the director is kind of pushed second. So when Dan and I, when we realised that Johnny, our best friend, was going to be kind of left out of that, we credited him as um, from an idea by Jonathan Butterell and cut him into our our slice of the pie, so that we were legally the the three co-authors of the project because that was the only way of fairly representing. It was his idea. He put it all together. He made it happen. This doesn't happen. And then when we did the film, and you get that a movie by, Johnny said, it's the three of us. So we have above the title a film by Jonathan Buffel, Tom McRae, and Dan Gillespie Sells. And I think I may be, my agent did say this, the only writer who ever got <laughs> the um, possessorial title, I think it's called, on a film, because it was it's our thing. So the trick is, if you want to be treated well as a writer is create the IP from scratch, have a hit stage show, and then take it out and, and own a chunk of it. It's quite hard to do that, and I don't know if I'll ever do it again. But um, yeah, you, actors are there to sell a show. It's it's kind of like, I mean, it's nice doing something like this because it, 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 it feels like a proper conversation, but I, I find it really hard to watch chat shows now because I know the actors are just there because the PR, it's in their contract, they have to be there. And you've had it too, there. I've watched, and you're right, you're asked the, the same kind of five questions over and over, and it's not delving into your actual creative process, the actual you know mission of your project. It has to be frustrating. I, I'm. It's you're selling tickets, and if you sell tickets, then people see your show, and if people see your show, then your show has a life. It's all about the show. When I see on the side of a bus or on a poster, everybody's talking about Jamie. For me, that might as well say Tom McRae, Tom McRae, Tom McRae. I know to the world it doesn't, but to me, that's all that matters. I see everything I need to see of myself in that. We were in West Hollywood, it was there all. I, lo I love it, and, and the actual West Hollywood the ones in the streets even had mine and Dan's name on the poster, which doesn't normally happen, so we had some pictures by the poster. But it's, I, I don't need, you know, I, I, I watched this show on a Sunday, uh, the last show, and I was standing there, huge standing ovation, and at one point I did just look around to, to, to take in the audience. Well, there was a standing ovation when I was there, opening night. That was for you. When, <laughs> <laughs> God, he's so, he's so quick. Um, when uh, he's he's my boy. Oh yeah, that's wh that when was they the actually first of many stopped the show to yeah. to, to honor Melissa uh, playing uh, Margaret so beautifully and, and that show is she wonderful? Yeah, um, she's great. but but so I see like all these people standing up and cheering and none of them know that I'm the guy who wrote all the words that, that they love. That has to be frustrating. No, 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 it's not frustrating at all. It's great because I don't have any hassle. I mean, I did a you couple don't have of the ego. A, a couple of people um, recognized me and wanted a picture. That's oh God, I've, uh, no, my ego is enough that I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll sign a thing and, and have a picture. How wonderful that you'd want that. That's that's a lovely ego boost. But everyone there was loving what I did, and then I get to just walk out without any hassle and go home. If I'd been on the stage, it'd be a whole p palaver. So, do you say palaver here? That feels very British. Nope. It'd be a whole two and eight. What's palaver? Kerfuffle. A kerfuffle. Yeah. Kerfuffle. Even we, uh, <laughs> the only person who said kerfuffle is Judge Judy. Does she? Yeah. Do you want to get into directing then? Yes. Yeah, I we, we, to hear we, that. we've got two things lined up this year. One of them, if it goes, it'd be me and Johnny doing it together. Stage or film? Uh, TV would be the first thing to hopefully then to get to do a film that I've written, which I'd like to do. And here's the thing: what you've done, your whole career is like, since I haven't done it, I'm not going to let that restrict me. Well, I've never done any of it. I'm just making all of but it up. But you're 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 doing it. So I have to know, at home, the two of you, are you reading yes. his drafts? Is he asking you Every for single one, opinions? Yeah. Oh, really? I mean, not necessarily opinions. I give them unsolicitedly. Unsolicitedly. But, yeah. but you get to see the... Yes. The it's difficult yes. to ask someone who you know loves you, whether it's a friend or a Danny or family, so what did you think? Because they're going to say... They loved it, right? So, well, no, no, no not so, at all. So I'd never ask. We're going to be I, the most if, honest no. people you've ever. I, had. I never say what do you think because the answer to that I suggest that I want you to say it's great, but I'll, I'm very happy to say nothing and then hear what the feedback is. I've given a couple of notes that have gone into a script. You want to share her? I'm. I can't. <laughs> it's for the Tom. As a partner, do you feel the pressure to like write a role for Danny? I've written him a few. He's Joel Cohen. I'm Francis, uh, I'm Francis McDormand. I, as long as I'm never asked to do a self tape, then I'm happy. That's my one rule: is no self tapes. I hate doing self tapes with actors. Is in filming and doing the feed lines. I hate it so much. It, it it just doesn't work, and I fear that this is the new generation of like TikTokers and all that. It it doesn't capture what an actual performer is. No, <coughs> no, I hate it. Um, Tom, are you writing a new musical? Yes. I am writing 
Is it a theater? I've got six on the go at the moment. Six musicals? Yeah, all the different stages. What I've got two, potentially three TV shows, which are musicals. One of which is we've written a lot of songs for and scripts for. Uh, a potential film, and then a new thing I'm starting very soon, which is going to be. The plan is to develop it as a stage show and a film at the same time, which is what we did kind of accidentally with Jamie, but to do it deliberately because it's great to test out. D- not, not that the stage is just there to test out for but the film. But they're two totally different products. Uh, t- they are. Di- and one of the things with Jamie that I regret is when I wrote the stage show, I didn't know it was going to be a film. And if I had known it, I would have written it in a way that would have given me more wriggle room on screen to do things differently but keep the same so songs. So I want to, with, with the new project... I want to write the songs and the stage show in a way where the songs are versatile enough that I can slightly shift the context a lot more for the screen because screen is so different. So like in the Jamie movie, when Hugo does the big new song, This Was Me, which isn't in the stage show, replaces the song in the stage show. And I watch the film and I think, I just want to stay with Hugo now and find out more about him. But we couldn't because, we did get we've, questions about because we've got these songs coming up, which the, the fans will want. And they pull it back to Jamie, and you're kind of locked into... You change the show to a point, but you can't change it to the extent that it's not your show anymore, because then why would it be Jamie? It should just be a new thing. And and I thought uh, I could have made choices in the stage show that would have given me more wiggle room, more leeway to make the film have a slightly different path and a different track, but still hit the same musical beats. So with the new thing, I'm going to write it. I, I think I might literally write... 10 pages of the stage show and 10 pages of the movie and then 10 pages of the stage show and keep going back and forward to make sure that I can make the film be the best film it can be and the stage show be the best stage show it can be. I haven't started writing yet, so that might all just be pie in the sky. Does that work? There's an American expression. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Danny pie in the sky. Danny pie in the sky. But uh, that's my plan is to, tr- is to make it so that the, the two can coexist um, deliberately from the start. But since you've been working on Jamie for like almost a decade... It evolves, so maybe the movie version should be different. Oh, no, that's what I mean. So the movie version will have to be different because movies are different from stage. So if you know, you know, in a film, you're going to have, what, five, six times the characters that you have on on stage. Well, maybe start thinking about who those characters are going to be, even though you don't meet them in the stage show, so that there's space for them to sit naturally in the narrative. So it's that kind of... I'm just, yeah, I'm going to go with my eyes a lot more open than I did with Jamie. And you get to, like, in, in film as well, you get to see a character's house. Like, re- really, truly see, you get to see a character's every house. Every room, every cupboard, every room, a closet. Like, everything. Like, in, in, in the theatre, you I mean, that kitchen in Jamie, I've spent all my mornings in that kitchen with my own mom. You know? It, it was just so The kitchens are a wonderful space. Everything good yes. happens in a kitchen. But True. Um, oh God, we have so many questions. Uh, uh, we have to end. Uh, <laughs> we're already done. Can you imagine? You have to. Cu- you guys have to come back. Cause okay. There's just like so many. Jamie Part Two could ruin my career all over again. No. Uh. Pu- pu- oh. Okay. How about this? You are in the movie, actually. Yes. We yes. both are. Dan. Both Dan, are. Dan Danny's. I'm. I I'm you oh well. Yes. yes. He's, he's proper featured. I'm just a, a silly cameo. Tell us. It was the first shot of the first day. Uh, filming in a little street in Sheffield that we were pretending was a street in London that was literally... Which Sheffield is the actual city. It's the actual city where it's set, where we opened, and that this street was just opposite the theatre where we'd opened Jamie all those years before. It's amazing. And Dan, not Danny, but Dan, my professional husband, we were drag nuns in the 80s flashback, and it was Max's first day, Richard D. Grant's first day, John McCree, who was the original West End Jamie, had come in to play young Richard D. Grant. It was his first day as well. And Dan and I did our drag cameos, and behind us were Dan's mum and my dad as the protesters. And my dad was dressed as a kind of old gay rights protester, and he waved his hat in the air and went, gay rights, gay rights. So watch that. Oh, you got got the clip? No, 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 no. no, no, no. no, no. (laughs) If I played two seconds of it, uh, you guys would, like, ask me to pay for it. But that's beautiful, so watch that movie. Um... Honestly, though, people have like because I think people see me and you together so much they think that I'm Dan. Yes, it, people do get confused. And people go, "I just love your, I love your songs," and then it's got to the point where I In just his go, English "I accent. just, I just go, yes, thanks." And I met Dan. Dan's like, amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but I, j- I now just take credit for Dan's work <laughs> because people think I'm him because it's like Tom and Dan, Tom and Danny. Yes, and they're like, "I just, I love your songs," and I'm like, "Yeah, they're great, aren't they?" Do you, I, do you want I, I to squeeze another question in? No, we have like uh, the questions I have are pretty deep. I do but need they're a from wee, your fans. To be fair, 
Like, okay, can I say that, that on the end air? On this. What are the top terms that you wish we were still using here in the U.S.? Still using or, or don't yet know. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's an awful word, but I've done my best to bring it to North America, which is minga, which is I've uh, never even heard it's that. it's I mean, the yeah. end of Act One of Jamie I, in the stage show in the film. I change it to freak show in the stage show in America and everywhere else, uh, the bullies turn up to berate Jamie and they call him a minga, which is an ugly, it, it means an unattractive woman in oh. slang, uh, British slang. Uh, but uh, he's, yeah, it's, it's, it's Jamie's kind of w um, the chink in his armour because he, he's very confident in many ways, but he's not confident yet as a drag queen. And so Dean and the, the guys go and they shout, minga, minga. And it's it's kind of an awful word, but it there's there's kind of something visceral and fabulous about it as well. So maybe that could take off. I think Austin Powers gave America shag, which I think to have a shag. And Madonna introduced wanker. I remember that happening. Yes. Um, and so I'd oh, and also uh, Madonna's British now. <laughs> also bollocks is a good one. Bell I wish people would. You know, what are some of your terms? I wish people would use. Bell end is a good one. Bell end. You know, I, I don't even know what that means. The it's tip your, of the penis. Yeah, you, you the fireman's helmet. A bell end? No, no, no. Not bell end. Oh. Bell end. Bell end. Ormwood. Bell end. Bell, bell end. end. Like Belinda Carlisle. Belinda Carlisle. It's <laughs> <laughs> my drag queen name. Um, but that doesn't have the same like. It's like, hey, you're a dick. Yeah. No, but like bell end. Oh no, 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 oh, no, no, no. Is it a fancy end. dick? He's such a you fucking no. bell end. Oh, you're such a you bell end. Don't be a bell end. Okay, that and Craig. And Graham, not Craig, not Craig and Graham. Graham. It's like Don. No, it's it's Craig and Graham. It's French and Saunders. Is it like yeah? That? It's Craig and Graham. Yeah. Craig Please, and that's how you pronounce Craig. Properly, it's Craig. So you go Craigslist. It's Craigslist, Craigslist. which doesn't exist here. Okay, doesn't it? And and it's, it's they did away with it. Oh. Graham, Where Graham, Graham Norton. From now? And it's, it's yeah, Graham Norton is one of my heroes. Graham, 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 Graham Norton. Graham, Graham Norton. It's like a Graham cracker. No, but it's, it's a Graham, Graham cracker. I'd like, like Golden I'd like, Graham's yeah. the cereal. I will tell you, Graham will do whatever you <laughs> call him. <laughs> okay. I Yeah, I believe you. Anyway, honestly, we have so many other questions about the play and the movie and your own personal life and Doctor Who. Uh, I just can't believe it's so late. I know. <sighs> but big thank you for having us on. Thank and you, also thank you because like, he plies us with alcohol. Vodka. Can Nift. we do like a part two? Yeah, sure. Right. All right. Tell everybody where you want them to find you and follow you. I am on Insta, Tom McWriter, T-O-M-M-A-C-W-R-I-T-E-R, -E and also on Twitter, Tom McWriter. And I am Danny Pie, at Instagram, at Danny Pie. That's Danny with an I-E and Pie with a Y. And also at Twitter, the same. He has a I good voice no for imagination. Like NPR, but he has a good voice for this. It's very, So very casting agents, terms. he's here. He's got yeah. a lovely Tom. Tom. <laughs> well, that's our episode. We or uh, uh, we still have more. We will answer your questions on part two. <sighs> it's always a grab bag of fun here and on the rocks. A big thank you to our fabulous guest, my engineer Tony Sweet, also owner of UBN. Our media uh, clip editor Alexis Mendez. Please share, share. <laughs> I said share. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe so we can continue to bring this to you for free. Uh, coming up, we have controversial reality TV and pop culture star. Courtney Stoddard. It's going to be very interesting. Um, also, we have CW's All American Homecoming playing the first black non binary character on the network. Royal Ivy King is coming. And then we have the master of the great American songbook, Michael Feinstein. He's also Liza Minnelli's best friend. She might call in, but I'm not promising. All right. Until next week, stay sexy, stay tipsy. Boop, boop. This has been another episode of On The Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Find everything On The Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.